India's bad debt problem is a bit different from what I mainly talk about in the book, uh, because it's a bit different from the predominant problems in the advanced economies. Uh, my theory is that the fundamental reason why uh, the 2008 crisis occurred and why we find it so difficult to recover from that crisis was not just things within the financial system itself over complicated financial innovation shadow banking. It was that the whole level of debt uh, of the whole real economy, households and corporates, uh, had risen to high, too high a level. Uh, over 60 years, from 1950 to 2007, uh, debt to GDP in the advanced economies went up from 50% to 170%. And for a set of reasons which I explore in my uh, book, um, if that occurs, and given that most of that growth of credit is against real estate, either residential, uh, individual real estate, or commercial real estate, there's a process whereby that is an accelerating, self-reinforcing process of more debt and higher asset prices, which then produces a crisis which makes it very difficult to escape from it. And that's what my, my book's about, and it's exploring a cycle that we've seen in Japan in the 1980s, uh, in uh, Scandinavia in the early 1990s, and then with catastrophic effect in the US and Spain and Ireland and many other countries in the run-up to 2008 and after. Now, what's interesting is that the Indian bad debt problem is not fundamentally the same as that uh, because the biggest problem in, in India is actually lending for investment, but too high levels of investment. Uh, one of the problems that the uh, advanced economies have got is that most bank lending isn't much to do with investment in plant and machinery any longer. It's basically the purchase of real estate that already exists. But in India, uh, the bad debts are concentrated in large corporates, uh, which in the years where people thought the economy might grow at 8 to 10 percent, invested in, in particular sort of uh, power stations, thermal power stations. And those are underutilized, uh, low plant load uh, factors, uh, because electricity growth has not grown as fast as they anticipated, partly because the economy has been slightly slower but also because there's been uh, major opportunities to improve uh, energy efficiency, which people had not uh, uh, anticipated. So this is a very particular problem, the Indian bad debt uh, problem, uh, concentrated in heavy industry, and of course, uh, with a large role of the public sector banks rather than the private sector banks. So it's a major problem. Uh, but it's a slightly different problem uh, from the one which, on which I concentrate. However, the, the, the India may get the more classic problem in future if it allows the growth of lending against real estate to grow and grow and grow. So I would watch the danger of that future problem while still thinking about what do we do about this particular problem that India already has. I think it's very, very important um, in thinking about debt, to think about three different functions that can perform in the economy. One is the function which is described in our economic textbooks. If you read an economic textbook, you would imagine that what banks do is they lend money to businesses to buy plant and machinery to invest. That's what the textbooks assume. And we need to understand that assumption. And we need to understand that sometimes that can run out of control with too much investment. And in a sense, that's what happened in a particular phase uh, in the power industry in India. There's a separate function uh, that uh, a lending can perform. And it's the predominant activity of banks in the advanced economies today, which is lending money to people to buy assets that already exist. And in particular, these assets are real estate. They're either uh, people borrowing uh, money to buy commercial real estate, hotels, uh, uh, you know, retail shopping malls, etc., or individuals uh, attempting to buy houses. Now, there is a role for that type of debt in an economy, but its economic function is not the same as lending for investment. Then there's a third category, which is lending to consumers so that they can spend money before they've got the income. And one of the cre crucial arguments of my book is there really hasn't been in the economic literature a distinction between those three different functions of debt. But they have very different dynamics. They have different implications. Well, I think I would not, I'd be a little bit careful of calling it good debt and bad debt. Because let me answer your other question. Is lending to individuals bad? No, it isn't bad. 
um, I think there is a role, a significant role in an economy for, for instance, individual mortgage debt. I think individual mortgage debt can enable people to uh, buy you know, houses uh, which they wouldn't otherwise be able to buy. But I think you can have too much mortgage debt. And I think if mortgage debt is too easily available, uh, funnily enough, it can be bad for the percentage of people who own their own houses. In the UK, up to about 1990, easier mortgage debt was helping drive an increase in owner occupation, the percentage of people that own their own house. But then mortgage debt goes so easy to be available that people who were simply buying to invest, to rent out to others, and who, because they were already a bit wealthy, had slightly better access to credit than less well-off people, they were able to borrow more money, and they were able to drive the price of houses up so high that many people couldn't even afford the deposits for the mortgage debt. So broadly speaking, I would say that with mortgage debt, there's a complicated function at work here, where up to a point, mortgage debt as a percent of GDP helps drive greater ownership of houses as a percentage of the total population, and then when it's too easy, it drives it back down again. And so one needs to understand that there isn't good debt or bad debt in a very, very simple fashion. Uh, there is most forms of debt can be good up to a certain level, but we can have too much of it. And that, I think, is one of the most important bits of economic theory, which my book is putting on the table, uh, and which I think has been underexplored in the past. I think there's a vital role for good regulation in controlling the banking system. Now, I think in the past, we've tended to define what good regulation is simply in terms of preventing banks going bankrupt and producing crises. But one of the things I argue in Between Death and the Devil, my, my recent book, is I argue that that's an insufficiently wide definition of the problem. That actually we can have problems even if banks don't go bankrupt. Because even banks that don't go bankrupt can lend so much money that the level of leverage in the economy builds up and up and up. And then it gets so high that everybody starts worrying about leverage. They cut their investment if they're a company. They cut their consumption uh, if they're uh, an individual household. And that drives the economy into recession. So we need to guard against that as well. How do we guard against that? I think we need sufficiently high capital ratios for banks that it's constraining the total amount of credit that they can create. But I also think in particular there is an enormous natural bias Certainly when uh, economies get above a certain income level, you certainly see it in all advanced economies, there's a naturally arising bias for the banking system to gravitate towards lending against real estate. Seen from a banker's point of view, that looks like the easiest thing to do, because as long as you've got good security, uh, it feels like even if the person can't pay, you can claim the property, and sell it off. So if you look uh, throughout uh, the advanced economies, there's a tendency for the banking system to get more and more focused on real estate over time. So what I'm arguing is not that you ban real estate lending, obviously not, but that given that you recognize that that is the naturally arising tendency of a banking system to somewhat overdo it on real estate lending, regulation should lean a bit the other way. It should set slightly higher capital requirements for real estate lending, and you do this through what's called the risk weights, set those slightly higher than banks would naturally do for themselves. Because banks can only be expected to focus on, am I going to be paid back? But if they're paid back by an over-leveraged borrower, who to pay you back is cutting consumption, and if there are millions of those simultaneously in the economy, even good lending, seen from a banker's point of view, can have a bad macroeconomic effect. So we need to lean against that in regulation. Now, that is not a broadly accepted point of view. The predominant attitude to regulation across the world is still that the focus is on making sure that the financial system itself is stable and doesn't go into crisis. What I've added to that argument is that we need to look at the indebtedness of the real economy. I, I, I think there's been a huge mistake in the global approach to banking regulation going back for decades to allow banks to operate as very highly leveraged uh, entities. No, there are some people who take my argument to a very strong extreme. Yeah. So um, there, there, there were a, a, a group of economists in uh, early 1930s uh, America who 
correctly understanding that one of the reasons why the American economy was in a catastrophic mess by 1931 was the overexpansion of credit uh, in the 1920s. And what was interesting about these economists, people like Irvin Fisher uh, and Henry Simons, is although in most areas of the economy they were extreme free marketeers, they thought that banks were so dangerous and that in the upswing would run so far out of control that essentially they wanted to abolish banks. They wanted banks only to be able to you know, uh, lend you know, long-term equity and long-term debt, which essentially is to abolish banks. They talked about what were called 100% reserve banks. Uh, lending would really occur not in the banking system, and banks would simply be holders of cash with all that cash at the central bank. Now, in my book, I explore, should we go that far? Um, uh, and I think it's important to understand these are not crazy ideas. These are the ideas of people who had observed the chaos created by a, a, an over-rapid expansion of credit. But I do think that they, we don't need to go that far. And I think there's an impracticality about going that far. But once you've realized that it's not mad to suggest that, you can pick a point on the spectrum which is a much higher level of capital and a much higher level of reserves than we currently allow the banking system to run at. You cannot entirely divorce the prudential issues from the conduct issues, but you can't also define it entirely in conduct terms. What I mean by that is part of the problem in the US was undoubtedly um, a banks and non-bank lenders deliberately encouraging people into uh, contracts, uh, mortgage contracts, where there was no reasonable expectation that they would be able to pay it back. And where what was going on is the whole thing was like a form of a Ponzi scheme. Uh, it only worked as long as the price went up because the borrower uh, borrowed under these teaser rates, very low rates of interest for the first couple of years, but then they shot up in the belief that by then the price of the house would have gone up and they'd be able to go to another provider and get a new contract to refinance it and have another couple of years of teaser rate. So that was going on on that side. And the thing which was going on on the investor side is people were packaging up these, uh, these uh, uh, loans into securities, and then they were selling it through to a group of investors who didn't really understand it. So there was mis-selling both on the credit side and on the other side. Now, now but you do need to deal with, with, with that issue, and that's where the conduct can have an impact on the macroprudential and the monetary. But you can have macroprudential and monetary sides even if you had a perfect conduct regime. Because I go back to what I said earlier, you can have an environment where if you simultaneously lend a lot of money to people all over the economy, even if every single one of them is able to pay back their debts, if it's too much debt at the level of the economy, the very fact that they do make sure that they pay back their debts is what tanks the economy into a depression. Well, I think the difficulty for a payment bank is how it competes with normal banks, and classic banks as we understand, which often underprice their payment services. I mean, one of the things that banks typically do is they have payment services in order to attract deposits, and they often don't explicitly charge. I don't know what the, 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 the issue is here in India, but they either okay. don't explicitly charge or they undercharge for the actual process of payments because they're getting the benefit of the money, which is a deposit which they can l lend, lend out. And so I think that makes it, in most parts of the world, certainly in the UK, it would be very difficult for a pure payment bank to operate. In the UK, people with current accounts pay nothing for payments. You have a current account, you've got money in your current account, the bank is getting the benefit of that as money which can lend out, and in order to get the benefit of that, it doesn't charge you for a check, it doesn't charge you uh, for a payment, it doesn't charge you for providing the information for account statements, etc. Now, I suspect that may be different at the moment in India, but I suspect over time, uh, there will be a difficulty for payment banks. Pure payment banks have typically found it difficult to compete with 
uh, payment and lending banks, you know, banks which do both functions, because the others are sometimes cross-subsidizing between the, the, the lending and the payment function, which then destroys the economics of the payment bank. So I don't know whether that is the case, but certainly that is the question that anybody backing a payment bank as a, as a, as a shareholder proposition would have to ask. India is really almost unique in the world in this, where gold is a significant amount of total household savings. And it's quite difficult for economists coming from another environment to sort of get our brains around uh, what that means. Uh, real estate is the predominant form of household wealth everywhere in the world. I mean, everywhere in the world. I mean, in, in, uh, uh, and in the advanced economies. I mean, in America or in, uh, in the UK, 70% oh, of all household wealth will essentially be in real estate. And if anything, that goes up over time. Because one of the things that people do as they get richer is they devote an increasing percentage of their time to buying real estate and to try and buying real estate in the pleasanter parts of town that have better services, better environments. It's a very logical thing to do because, you know, after a while as people get richer, they've got as many clothes and food and washing machines as they need. You know, one of the most obvious things to do is you want an, a really nice place to live. So real estate is actually something which is, you know, not as it were, as you say, stuck in the cave of the old thing. It's, it's part of, it, of the way all advanced economies work as well. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it does create a major financial stability danger. Because if you take that real estate is the most natural form, a growing form of wealth holding uh, in a rich economy, if you take also that it is the easiest thing for a bank to lend against, then you put the two together and you have a huge possibility for that suddenly to unleash a self-reinforcing cycle where more credit is extended to buy real estate. Everybody thinks, oh, real estate's going to go up further, so I better borrow more. The banks think real estate's going to go up further, so they think it's going to be safe to lend more. People who didn't want to be part of this spiral, have to be part of this spiral because they think I better borrow some money and buy this real estate now because otherwise we won't be able to afford it in two years' time. And as the uh, economist Hyman Minsky uh, pointed out, a, a, an economist who was largely ignored before the crisis, um, the, the way in which banks lend more and more money against assets and price goes up uh, is, is inherent to financial instability. And there's work by uh, Claudio Borio and others at the Bank for International Settlements that has illustrated that the particular asset that people buy is real estate. And the cycle of credit against real estate turns out to be, really for the last 30 or 40 years, it's not, it's not just part of the story in financial instability in uh, advanced economies is pretty much the whole story. So one of the things that I argue very strongly that uh, regulators and central banks have to watch very carefully as uh, economies grow uh, is that to, to manage and control and, and, and tamper down uh, that, uh, that credit cycle, because otherwise, uh, the credit and real estate cycle, because otherwise it can run out of control. I mean, if you go back to the 1997 crashes in Thailand, in Korea, in um, uh, 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 Indonesia, that had a lot to do with over-the-top real estate development, banks overexposed uh, to uh, real estate. Uh, pretty much the whole of the problem that occurred in Japan in around 1990 uh, and the long period of slow growth there rather, was, was brought about by an over-the-top a credit and real estate boom, and indeed the, the country in the world where we should be most worried about this at the moment is actually China. Uh, India is a long way behind, but it's beginning to develop, and the regulators should keep an eye on it well before it ends up in a crisis. Here is the problem, and, and uh, I have, uh, as has Ben Bernanke, suggested that under certain circumstances one uses what we call helicopter money. I would not recommend it in an emerging market economy like India. I have, however, said that it's bound to occur in Japan, and I think it would have been better to do it in the UK. Now, let me explain what the fundamental concept is and why I make that distinction. I think that if you, first of all, create too much private debt, and that's what we did across the advanced economies before 2008, if you do that, you enter a situation, which is where we were in 2009 and 10, where you've got so much debt in the economy that none of your normal classic levers work. You cut the interest rates to zero, but if people have decided they've got too much debt to start with, they are determined to pay down the debt, even if the interest rate on the debt 
is zero. That's clearly what happened in Japan in the 1990s, and that is what happened in the US and the UK and other places after uh, uh, 2009. So you then enter a situation, well, how am I going to get the economy going again? And some people say, well, we should use fiscal deficits paid for by the issue of debt, and those undoubtedly are stimulative to the economy. Indeed, all the advanced economies agreed to do that initially uh, back in, in 2009. But after a while, people worry about, but how am I going to pay back that debt? So you seem to be stuck. The monetary policy won't work. In a great phrase from John Maynard Keynes, you're, you're pushing on a string. You change the policy, but nothing happens at the other end of it. And the fiscal policy seems constrained by, oh my god, if I rid of this debt, how am I going to repay it? Now, what Ben Bernanke said to the Japanese in 2003 is, if you are really stuck in that position, realize that you can have the central bank print some money, give it to the government, and the government spends it, either on tax cut or public expenditure. And there are some circumstances where that is what you should do. I think if Germany had done that in 1931, you might never have had Hitler coming uh, to power. And so there are extreme circumstances which it, in which it's possible. And there are extreme circumstances in which it's discipline. It's possible to discipline that. Because the absolute legitimate worry is, oh my god, but if you make it obvious to the politicians that that's possible, won't they want to do it all the time? And in particular in the run-up to elections, rather than only in those specific circumstances of a post-crisis deflation in which it's been appropriate. So the classic attitude to helicopter money uh, from many economists has been, you know, yes Adair or yes Ben Bernanke, I agree with you that in theory it's the best policy, but the trouble is we can't introduce it without the political risk that it's misused. Now, broadly speaking, I think that in the UK and in Japan and in America, we could control that political risk. I think we could give to our independent central banks the authority to determine how much helicopter money they think is appropriate and only that amount. I think in India or in Brazil or in Indonesia, if you first admitted that it was possible, you would start getting situations not where the central bank was making an independent decision to do it, but where they were being told to do it by the prime minister uh, or the finance minister. So I think this is a policy which, in the developed economies, in conditions of post-crisis deflation, can be introduced and can be subject to discipline, but I would not recommend it in uh, you know, emerging markets which don't have that long-term history of robust central bank independence from the instructions of government. Well, I think it might have been a better thing to do way back in 2009 um, to get what the... Do, I mean, well, I, I, think, I think America was one of the things where the, the existing policy mix worked better than anywhere else. I mean, uh, there's also an intermediate stance, by the way, where you run a large fiscal deficit in the classic fashion, which is funded by debt, but where the central bank then buys the debt. And the central bank buys the debt in a quantitative easing operation, saying that it will sell it back. But we don't know whether it will sell it back. So that's a sort of intermediate thing. And I think that's what's eventually worked in the US. So I think uh, in the UK, I think we should have done it. And I think it would have been a better policy in 2009. <laughs> in the US, the US economy actually the, the interesting thing about the US economy is in the second half of the second Obama term, it wasn't doing all that bad. It was growing. Real wages were growing. And so I think you can't put down uh, Donald Trump's defeat, uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, uh, victory, to the economy doing badly in the short term. I think what he tapped into was rising inequality and various people who'd lost out not just in the last two years, actually often in the last two years they'd done relatively better than before, but he tapped into a rising resentment which had been going on for 20 or 30 years. You've ra raised a complicated set of issues there. I mean, INET was set up after the 2008 crisis uh, in belief that the uh, standard neoclassical economics had done a really lousy job at equipping us with an understanding of how that crisis was created. And uh, neoclassical economics had told us stories about efficient markets, efficient markets which in turn depended on 
rational expectations, which were simply not true. Uh, they were not dis good descriptions of reality, and they led us seriously astray. Now, they led us seriously astray uh, in the arena of financial stability and macroeconomics in that which determines the overall stability of the economy and whether we have uh, unnecessary depressions, etc. I think they have also led us astray in the bit which you're focusing on, which is what is the relationship between the financial industry and consumers, uh, which is what we tend to call it being the first one is, is prudential, macroprudential, and monetary, and this is the appropriate conduct. Because it's also true that once you start challenging the idea of rational expectations in efficient markets, it is not clear that you can get good results simply by rationality and disclosure. Um, and I first got very interested in this, actually, before I did my work as the chair of the Financial Services Authority. I was chair of a pensions commission in the UK between 2003 and 2006. And people had been saying, you know, British people are under saving for a future pension. And what we therefore need is to educate people more. And we need the private sector to uh, make sure that they fully understand uh, what the charges are. And if they're educated to want to save, they'll save. And if there's lots of disclosure, they'll save in an efficient way, uh, you know, choosing somebody who's good value for money. And it turned out that both propositions of those uh, were wrong, um, that uh, uh, individuals in their savings decisions are incredibly heavily uh, influenced by what we call nudge factors, I, the ability of somebody to suggest what the answer is rather than they rationally develop it. And the crucial insight here, which my commission uh, uh, realized and which we've then applied, and it's one of the biggest uh, experiments in behavioral economics uh, across the world now, is if you ask somebody when they join a company, do you want to join the pension scheme, you might get 40% of people tick, I want to join the pension scheme. If you simply turn the answer the other way around and say, we will put you into the pension scheme unless you sign here to opt out, you may find only 10% opt out and 90% stay opted in. And this is a complete breach of rational economic theory because the decision is the same. You've just expressed the question differently. But there's huge empirical evidence that the way you frame the question changes the behavior. So the UK now has a government-encouraged pension scheme in which everybody in the country is naturally enrolled into a pension unless they consciously opt out. And this has been successful beyond our wildest dreams. But this shows the power of what is called behavioral economics. And behavioral economics is based upon understanding the people, the way really people really behave, uh, make economic decisions, rather than starting from the assumption, let me assume that they're all rational, and let me assume that they all sit down there of an evening and work out all the actions they could possibly take and work out the net present value of all the different things they can do and maximize it. People don't work like that. So the answer is in the area of personal financial services, there may be a role for these nudge factor uh, approaches, and there may also be a role for categories of uh, you know, price regulation to limit the price level, rather than simply saying, provided I uh, provide enough disclosure, individuals will make rational choices. Because as you say, the disclosure-based regulation you know, it tends to produce just pages and pages of disclosure, which nobody ever reads. And if you ask most people, when they get something on here and says, have you read and do you agree with the terms and conditions, pretty much everybody ticks it without reading anything. Uh, and they do that with financial services contracts as well. So it is a major problem.